So we're in the fourth lesson on Philippians. Filipinos. So just to recap of what we've looked at. What? Philippians. Philippians. <laughs> Uh, now I want some of that. So now I want some papaya. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, so just to recap of what we've looked at, Philippians was written by Paul while he was impris imprisoned after much suffering, <coughs> and the Philippian church is also suffering. Um, suffering is a blessing, not a curse. Uh, watch out for others at the expense of yourself. Uh, we prove ourselves blameless when we obey God and don't complain or fight. Uh, it doesn't matter if someone ever leaves the faith in the future. Share your joy with them. Rejoice and help them to rejoice. So, the question that I want to start us off with, what does it mean? We, we looked last week in Philippians 2.13. It said this, For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What does it mean that God is at work in us to will and to work for his good pleasure? What the heck does that mean? Um, I guess it's a way to look at it, I guess. Good. Um, God works in us, changes our hearts, so we can go to work, to do the work in others, and God takes pleasure that we are obedient to do the work that he put in us, mm -hmm. that we put in others, so he takes pleasure. Yes, yes, but there's another part of this. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So you got the work part right. But what does that first part mean? To will. What? Nicole, it looked like you were... Th I have you to were... Look at my translation because I don't know um, what that means. I guess to, both, to most likely do it with, with a willing heart and to do it without complaints. In a way. In a way. In a way. It's not that you're necessarily wrong. It's that I think maybe we can be a little more precise. What do you guys think? Let's see what Zach. What, what do you think? Would that be? Uh, two thirteen. Zach, what do you, what do you think? What, what does that mean to will and to work? A little confusing, huh? Yeah. What does the CSB say in Philippians two thirteen? Like, um, hmm. hold, hold on just a second. Oh, okay. What does the CSB say? Uh, for it is God who is working in both you and you both to will and to work according. So it says about the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Now what now, Gracie? Is it, um, does that have to do with, you know, God has a will for us? And not really, because the will in the sentence isn't God, it's the Philippians. And the if subject I translate of it. the way I, it's written in mine, the will means that he desires to do the work in us. Right, except that God is not the subject of this, the Philippians yes. are. God is working in them to yes. will and to work. So that their desire would be... To yes. Good yes. Uh, I was yes. God is at work in us to will, in other words, to make us want to do the right thing, and then for us to actually do the right thing. Right. For us to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay. That we would actually want to what he's do doing, it. but that we would also do it too. Right. To will and to work. Very cool, huh? I was looking at that and I was like, we didn't even look at that, and I don't even know what the heck this means. So I looked that sick around. Okay, so we're in Philippians 2.19. Last week we stopped with, But if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifices and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. And so that takes us to Philippians 19. Yep. So, remember, 2.18, he, he ended that, that section by saying, Share your joy with me. So now 2.19. But I, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else 
of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interest, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served w uh, with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Now, when I first read this, I misunderstood what he was saying. I thought he was saying, there are no others. Now, we know that Peter is in Rome at this time. So is he saying that Peter is going off and and only interested in himself? Is he saying that there are no other Christians in all of all of Rome? That seems like a pretty pretty condemning and judgmental attitude to have. I thought yeah. this was supposed to be a book of encouragement. Right. Well, if you look at it, he's more of commending Timothy, not so much as tearing others down. Paul is concerned for them, so he sends Timothy. Okay, not there is no one else, but I have no one else. Okay, watch this. Okay. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Okay, I, Paul is concerned for them, so he sends Timothy. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. I have no one else to send. Not there is no one else. Remember that. It's a very, very big difference. In other words, what he's saying is, it, I'm in prison and the only one here with me is Timothy. Right. So what was Timothy doing there? Um, well, it's uh, Paul talks a lot about how Timothy is like a son to him. It's possible that he's just kind of uh, encouraging him, or just doing errands in, in Rome for him. You know, like, hey, go and just do oh, this so for he me. So he just visits Paul in prison. Well, or he's just hanging out, but he's not imprisoned. Right. That's All right. right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Timothy's free to roam about, but All for whatever right. reason, he's there for a prolonged amount of time. All right. It looks like um, so there's basically nobody. Else. Right, it's just pretty much he's there in prison, and Timothy's kind of hanging out with him. Yeah. And other people are off doing their own thing. Right. Mine, uh, in the ESV, it says, for I have no one like him. Okay, that, okay, that would fit. So. That, it, it, it captures the idea. That's fine, yeah. that That's ESV? Yeah, that, that's about the same idea of it. The idea that, you know, that it... Basically... You know, it's me, it's me and Timothy here, but I actually like that better. Let, let's yeah. kind of divert to, to, to that a little bit. The idea there would kind of be, be when I was saying about how – let me say how I, want, how I want to think this. Okay. When I said about how um, Paul is more commending him than tearing down other people, I think that the SV kind of summarizes that a little bit better than the NASB. So read it again. <clears throat> For I have no one like him. Who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare? Yeah. Uh, Mine says, "For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care for your interests." Okay. Either way, I think it gets the point across. He's on the same page with Timothy, right? right. And he he cares with for the Philippians just like Timothy does. They're on, they're on the same page. He doesn't have to go and train someone else to get on the same page. They're on the same they're page. All, yeah. I mean, either either way, I think that I think that ESB and CSB were just really complimenting each other there. Yeah. Um. Okay, so anyways, uh, what was I going to say? So Paul, here, so here, Paul, here, Paul, or, yeah, Paul is in Rome, and Peter comes to visit him. But it looks like what's happening is Paul has the equivalent would be like a hearing, a court hearing. Think of it like that kind of. So he's in prison, and he's he's got this this hearing coming up, and this hearing will decide whether he is freed or not. Right. And Timothy evidently maybe came for this, but either way, he's staying for it. And so Paul is about to tell them he'll go and visit you guys after right. we find out whatever whatever's going on here. Right. So anyways, um, Peter's in Rome, but not available to go on a trip for Paul. Basically, the idea is not that there are no other believers. I really want to get that across. Oh. Because some people have said that Paul is at odds with the church leadership, and he's actually teaching doctrine that is not... Um, not according to what the church was teaching. For instance, what Peter was teaching. Right. They based this off of Second Corinthians, where it says, um, "He's." Well, I'll just turn there. It'll take me like five seconds to turn there. It'll take me like twenty minutes to explain this stupid thing. <laughs> and Second Corinthians um, ten, I think.
right here. Uh, chapter 11, verse 5, it says, of 2 Corinthians says, For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. Some translations say to these so-called super apostles. He's making fun of these people who are calling themselves apostles. And some people have assumed, well, that must mean that he's talking about Peter and the other leaders of the church. Because there weren't that many apostles, A. And B, because of some stuff going on in the letter itself. But there's really no reason to assume that. Um, you really have to read into the text to get that. Not only that, but elsewhere we see Peter doing nothing but affirming Paul right. in uh, his own letter. I think it's Second Peter or 1 Peter that I'm thinking of. So there's really no reason to assume that. Um, but either way, Peter's not on Paul's beck and call. <laughs> like, uh, it's not like Paul has all the authority in the church. The church wasn't as organized as the later Roman Catholic Church would make it, okay? Where there was like a clear power struggle. It was not that way. It was right. more. It was structured, but it was more. I want to say free flow than than the rigidity of the Roman Catholic Church. Anyways, I'm getting off topic here. So Tim, in other words, what he's saying is Timothy is the very best he can offer, and they know him. So, hey, double double whammy there. He says there, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth. In other words, you know this guy. They served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. There is no other way that I can think of that Paul could have said, hey, this is the best I have to offer. So that takes us to... Um, Hop down to 25, skip 23 and 24. But I thought it necessary to, to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who also is your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So let's just stop right there. They had sent Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was there with Paul at the prison because the Philippians had sent them to him. Now we're going to find out later in the letter that they had actually sent him a financial contribution. Epaphroditus was the one who brought that. Okay. So, uh, however, when he got there, he got sick, and he got sick to, the, sick to the point of death. And the Philippians had heard about this, so this is why he says here, um, um, in twenty-six. Uh, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. So that takes us to 20, 27. I'll wait to pull that up. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me. So I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. So there's a few things actually that I want to point out from this verse. First off, it's okay to be sad when someone dies. Sometimes people and Christians take that one verse in Thessalonians, I think it's... It's First Thessalonians, where he says, it might be saying it's Thessalonians, but I think it's the first one, where he says, um, do not uh, mourn like those who have no hope. P some Christians have taken that and said, okay, that means Christians should never feel any kind of sorrow anytime anybody dies, but that's just stupid. Paul here himself is admitting if Epaphroditus would have died, it would have caused him sorrow. So even though we know where people are going, it doesn't mean that we will never experience uh, sorrow. Right. Um, secondly, that I think this point is this verse is clearly uh, pointing out here is that God is sovereign over the situation. Look at this. For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me. See, Paul, which is exactly what the Old Testament says, put the outcome of the situation uh, outcome of the situation um, squarely on uh, on God. There we go. Uh, put it squarely on God. Um, and then the third thing that I want to point out from this verse is that even when you are doing what God wants you to do, there there are still struggles that come. See, Paul didn't know for sure if Epaphroditus was going to die when they were in the middle of the situation. And sometimes we get this idea that, okay, surely if God um, w is going to call me to do this thing, everything is just going to work out. But that's not what happens, and I think that this verse clearly shows that. Um, it, he could have died. God didn't have to spare him just because it, you know Paul was doing and Epaphroditus was doing what God wanted. I mean, that's not how this works. It's not like, a, okay, God, I did something for you. Now you do it for me. Right. Um, yeah, so, okay. Scratch your back, you scratch right. <laughs> right. So Philippians 28, 228. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. So Paul has sent Epaphroditus with the letter 
Epaphroditus is the one who carried Philippians to the Philippian church. Okay, not Timothy. That was that was something that I misunderstood when I first read this letter. I thought Timothy brought the letter, but yeah. no, Epaphroditus sent the le brought the letter. Um, and the reason why he, Paul has sent Epaphroditus with the letter is so that it will make them happy because they'll see him again. Okay, so then that takes us to verse 29. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. So he respects him, Paul respects him, and they should too. Sometimes we take people for granted, but it's okay to acknowledge the good people do and to genuinely be happy. Sometimes, guys, I grew up in church my whole life. Like, I know these things. I, I know these things from perfect personal experience. There's a lot of times that Christians don't think they can be happy. They think it's like almost like a sin, you know. Um, they're they're afraid to 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 enjoy life too much because oh you know I don't know you know what right. um, and and so it's okay to be happy. The second off, um, it's okay to acknowledge the good that people do. Some people think oh well you can't acknowledge people who do a good thing in the church because only God deserves the glory. Well yes I'm not saying bow down and worship somebody who does a good thing. But there is a middle ground where you can still acknowledge that somebody did a good thing yeah. without turning it into them being God. I mean, <laughs> right. I grew up in a church where you were not allowed to compliment people for what they did. And my parents actually, and if you ask them, they'll tell you the same thing. I'm not it's like I'm talking behind their back or anything. Right. They didn't believe in um, you know, giving us pats on the back or, or acknowledging when we did anything right because they didn't want us to be prideful. So what we see here is that such a strict approach towards the church is not really warranted. It is okay to acknowledge, acknowledge when people do something good. And it's okay also if the attention isn't on you. See, Paul is okay here with the attention not being on him or on the Philippians, but on Epaphroditus. He did a good thing. It's okay to acknowledge that. So these might seem like small details, but growing up in a legalistic environment like I did, these are actually pretty big deals to me. Um, okay, so anyways... Uh, and sometimes we do take people for granted. You can know that you're taking somebody for granted if you know anybody. <laughs> Eventually, we take people for granted in life. We just It's just a habit of, of people. We, we all do it to some degree. All right, so then in verse 30, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, so you should hold him in high regard, um, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Now, see, that confused the crap out of me. Did you catch that? Let me read it again. Risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Okay, Paul, cal calm down there, buddy. <laughs> well, and then you realize it's actually more of an issue with translation than anything. What was deficient? That's the question. See, if you read it in my translation, it said, to complete what was deficient in your service to me. Okay? But, let's go ahead. Mine says, backing in ministry to me. Yes. Right. Same idea. Same, same idea. Yeah. Uh, Grace, you have CSB. It was the same thing as Zach's. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. You have oh. a CSB. Oh. Right. Yeah. But ESV says lacking as well. It's, it, is that what mine said? No, you said deficient, right? Deficient, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Um, so the idea is what was deficient? Their presence. <sighs> Their presence was what was deficient. So what come, the problem comes in how we translate that. We're, we're just – it's something that you don't really understand unless you're reading it through in more of the original language. You can kind of see the flow of what he's saying, and I don't really have time to get into that. Just roll with me on this. I, I'm saving you a long time of me rambling by just saying he's talking about their presence. Their presence was deficient. He risked his life to complete what was missing in your service to me, which was your presence. Okay. Um, by Epaphrodite is coming, um, it made up for the Philippians and Paul being apart. And uh, the way of translating this would be uh, to make up for those services that you could not give me. Well, what were those services that you could not give me? Your presence. We were separated by distance. Um, so once again, that's the short and easy version. I can I can refer you out to other commentaries if you actually want a more thorough treatment of it. I have, a, I have a commentary that went on for four pages um, okay. explaining this verse. So I really will try just trying to save you all the misery of trying to figure that out. So now we can hop back to verses 23 to 24 and it says this. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And he's talking about Timothy here. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be, will be coming shortly. So here we have two different things that Paul's saying. 
Paul will send, t send Timothy once he knows what's going on. They're, they're, they are waiting his arraignment or whatever you want to call it. They're waiting his court hearing. Okay, And after that, when they know what's going to happen, Paul will sell, send Timothy. And he hopes, he plans, that the, at this hearing they say, hey, you're good to go, and they'll release him too. In which case he would follow after Timothy. Right. Okay? So, uh, everybody didn't take notes? Okay, Nicole? You can go ahead, teacher. Okay, Gracie, are you good? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so that takes us into chapter 3. Did I read that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, but it is a safeguard for you. It is a safeguard. Did you hear what he just said? Yeah. Rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard. That is a, I mean, how many times I have read that, all those people who read this read this book three times this month. Did you catch that when you read it through? You didn't? Did you catch it? I did not. Gracie, did you catch it? Which verse? In chapter 3, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard. I have read Philippians through probably 20 times. And in the last year, I've read it through probably 12 I times. I kind of caught it about the third time. You did? Yeah. You did catch it? Yeah. Because I did not catch it until I was writing out my commentary. I was like, wait, what? Rejoicing in the Lord is a safeguard for us. Now, this has lots of different applications if we look at it in context. It helps us against, um, against believing wrong things because we're focusing on God, and God just has a way of speaking to our spirit. It helps us against getting discouraged. He's talking about being in times of suffering. Rejoicing is a safeguard against that. It helps us through when we're when we're sick and we're, and we're down and out and we're just discouraged about the situation with our health. Rejoicing is a safeguard. Look at it in context and see the different things he's been a addressing, both with being persecuted and, 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 and going through bad health and all these different things. And he plops that right there. And also by using the term a safeguard, he is now propelling us into a change of conversation. Whereas before he's been talking about you know travel and all those different things, now he's going to shift shift the um, what he's talking about to address a specific problem that the Philippians are either about to experience or are experiencing. In verse two, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we, excuse me, are the, are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So there's a few things that he's saying here, and I hope to hit them all, okay? First off, in verse 2, he says, beware the dogs. Now, this sounds this sounds kind of bad until you realize that Jews call Gentiles dogs. So what he's saying is he's flipping on them. Beware of the dogs. Oh, beware of Gentiles, but we're Gentiles. Yeah. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Oh, so he's not talking about us. See what I mean? Like yeah. he, it, it's uh, irony if you would, or, or sarcasm. There's a there. He, you could, you, eh, why not? Um, so he's kind of turning something on on, on that, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Um, but here's the problem: he is either talking about one of two groups of people. The first groups of people is called Judaizers. Now these were basically people who tried to combine Jewishness with Christianity. Uh, Today we call them Messianic Jews. I think would be a yeah, pretty good yeah. equivalent. They're pretty much the same thing. They're small differences, but basically the same thing. In other words, we have to follow the law and Christ. Okay, adding yeah. works to the law, basically. Okay, yeah. Messianic Jews to do the exact same thing. So uh, he could be talking about this. We know that Paul has dealt a lot with Judaizers, but here's the problem with that. Philippi didn't really have a large Jewish population okay. enough to, to warrant that, so I don't know. That seems a little bit confusing, but at the same time, that kind of, we have the same problem with the second option that they were Jews who were troubling them. Either way, it's a little bit confusing. As I I honestly didn't think that I thought Philippians was like 99% uh, or Philippi was it was 99% Rome Roman and like 1% mixed race. So evidently, there was a large enough Jewish population either as Judaizers or as Jews, people who did not accept the Messiah as Jesus. Um, to warrant some kind of trouble. Now, we know a few things about Philippi. First off, we know that a lot of Romans, Roman uh, soldiers retired here. They had a very large 
uh, Roman soldier population. Um, we know that it was, if I remember correctly, if I'm thinking about the right city, it was a port city. It was, it was a lot of trade that went through. Um, but it, overall, it wasn't overly a very large city. Um, so we have, a, we, have a, we have a few questions there. Either way, these group, this group, which Paul never clarifies whether it's the Judaizers or the Jews, are causing some kind of a problem. Now, if it is the Judaizers, this could all be and this could all be explained by the fact that they might just be traveling around trying to disturb the Christian church. In other words, uh, Paul, you know, as he goes establishing the church, they might be following after him to places that they know that he that he's gone to try and convert them into yeah, adding the right. law to their works. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, the law into their faith. So. Ultimately, we don't know. Maybe there was a large Jewish population. I'm just completely ignorant about this. That's possible. Um, there's a, you'd be surprised how many things about history that A, we don't know, and B, that I specifically don't know. Right. <laughs> so, uh, in verse three, he says, "We are not that we are. Sorry, we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh." So the first thing to note there is that he called them false. Circumcision. In other words, what is a false circumcision? People who believe in. Um, okay, so let me give you the short version here. God made a covenant with Israel, and this was enacted by uh, cutting the foreskin off the penis, called circumcision. Yeah. However, that covenant was done away with with a better covenant when Jesus died. A new covenant was enacted. Jeremiah thirty one verses thirty one through thirty three. I think talk about this somewhere in there. Anyways, and so the idea is that we, is that there is a new covenant that has been given. Okay? Now, under this new covenant, we are circumcised in the heart. Okay, And so he is clearly saying that the law, whether it's Judaizers or Jews that are saying this, is of no benefit to us in our salvation. Okay, That's important to remember because a lot of people still want to try and teach the Old Testament law as though it still has bondage to us. Now, it is still valuable. Right. We, know, we know about morality from the Old Testament law. Okay? And we are still held to do the right thing. Right. Okay. We are still commanded not to worship other gods, for instance. But times have changed, yeah. and so not all the laws directly apply. For instance, it says about moving fabric together and shaving the edges of your beard and, and marking yourself, and all. Yeah. It talks about a lot of different things that just don't really happen in the same context. We live in a completely different world. It's been 3,400 years since the law was given. So. You kind of have to remember these things in perspective, and there are some things that always are the same, don't ever worship other gods, and then there are some things that aren't always the same, Right. you know, like this is how you should treat your slaves, well, we don't have slaves, so it doesn't really apply. So, anyways, you get what I'm saying. Um, so, okay, we are not saved by works of the law, which is the short version of what he's saying here. We are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and, uh, and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. But he says those three things, and let's look at them. First off, he says, who worship in the spirit of God. The first thing is worship. That, in this context, is not talking about necessarily singing. It's talking about serving. We serve in the spirit of God. In other words, he, he's contrasting the Jews who serve in the temple. Well, we don't serve in the temple. We serve in the Spirit of God. Right. So in other words, they're trying to say we have a better right to God because we serve in a temple. Well, we serve in the, in the Spirit, and we can go anywhere, in or out of a temple, and we still serve the God. You know, it must have been hard, like, because, I, I, uh, um, I don't know, uh, me writing the, the, the Bible, mm -hmm. it kind of like makes me think like, you know, Jew, Jesus coming and, and changing everything, the law, and... I bet it just took years for them to break what they used to do in yeah. the past, yeah. now to do this. Yeah. Right. So it's not like it's like I I yeah. I'm putting me in their shoes. Yeah. Like so I kind of understand why are they having such a hard time still following the yeah. old law, and then Paul is trying to bring the new law. You know, it's just like, yeah. wait a minute, <laughs> what is happening here, you know? Yeah, I, I'm going to have to back you up on this one. Um, yeah. There's sometimes when people come to a church and they expect it to be more um, rules and traditions. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because they've always heard it that way. And so then you try and change something in a church that really doesn't have any importance in and of itself. Like ch taking out pews and putting in chairs. 
but to them, it is blasphemy against God himself because you made a change. And so we're not talking about moving a chair into an auditorium. We're talking about saying, here is the Messiah, and your temple, which you have safeguarded, now is of no profit to you. Yeah. And your law, which was the only thing that kept you, not, you, you united when Babylon kicked your sorry butts out of Jerusalem in the first place, is now... Next to profit, well, it's still profit. It's still profitable, but it's not binding anymore. Right. Wow, what a change of perspective. So I totally get what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, and then uh, who worship in the spirit of God? So, so we don't serve in a temple. We serve in, in the spirit of God. And the same thing says is and glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, glory would be to put trust in or boast in. Um, he's contrasting this with how Jews and Judaizers don't really trust in in God. <laughs> they they more trust in you know their own goodness and stuff. Um, in this case, specifically as it applies, they trust in uh, circumcision because he says in the next part and put no confidence in the flesh. Now, obviously, he's not just talking about uh, circumcision specifically, but uh, the works of the law. You know but in confidence in the flesh, the things done in the flesh. So, uh, for the Jews, it was all about their family tree. That's another way that they put confidence in the flesh. I'm of the lineage of Gideon. I'm of the lineage of the tribe of Judah. I'm of the lineage of... See what I mean? It, it, it was all about family line, and that's what really made you. And they didn't even know how to address their relationship with God outside of where they came from. Everything about their religion was not about God. It was about my heritage. You know, it, a lot of this, um, I hope this doesn't come, out, come across as, as racist, but Native Americans do a very similar thing. Um, they will partake of dark activity because it's a part of their quote unquote culture. Yeah. Yeah. But that culture has to be moved past to truly put your faith in Christ. You can't worship ancestors and spirits that live in trees and stuff and God. You can only worship one. And so that's a direct conflict with the culture, uh -huh. with the Native American culture. And the same thing is true here. It's a direct con conflict with the Jewish culture. And then another thing, um, it was all about what they did in the law. Their whole life revolved around um, the Sabbath, uh -huh. around their festivals and, and, and holidays, around um, – you think if you think old old timey Christians are bad with Christmas, you should have seen you should have seen Christians with their with their boost of ta or, or, or uh, feast of, of tabernacles and all that nonsense. I mean, goodness sakes, don't even don't even get me started. Uh, and then obviously with their circumcision, um, that was that was the big thing. Um, yeah. so, so it just totally so different. So I have a question. Sure. So when God gave the law, which they were following. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were doing what God has told them, except the heart was in the wrong place. Is that what you mean, right? They were oh, doing so much more thing. complex than that. I'm, I, this is why I'm writing an entire book on this, guys. Because, <laughs> okay, I'm trying to think of an easier answer. So, can you ask the question again? Like the God, God gave them the law mm -hmm. of, of what they, you know, to keep the Sabbath, do the circumcision, and all this. So they were doing it. Mm -hmm. Except they were doing it as of. As a, just a law because God has told them or they were doing because they actually honored what God was doing, was telling them to do. Well, there's, there's a few problems. First off, they were doing it as though salvation was by doing the works of the law. If I keep the Sabbath, if I offer sacrifices, then I, that my works will save me. Right. But the law makes it clear that they would do that and God would – and if they did it in faith – then God would God would save them, not like because what Abraham did right. Okay, not because there was anything necessarily powerful about observing the Sabbath or offering sacrifices, but because God would overlook their shortcomings and and accept the sac the substitute of the sacrifice so because they were, they were just doing, doing it, it as a right, and they and way. they missed the purpose of it too. Okay. The purpose of the law was to unite people to God. That was the idea of the law. The entire law was summarized in two very simple statements, love God and love people. But they completely misunderstood all of that and thought it was all about the law. See, let me kind of clarify. So God gave a promise and said, okay, I'm going to save all people. He gave it to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. He said, okay, 
I'm going to bless all nations through you. So he gave the promise, but he knew it was going to be a long time before Jesus came. So he gave the law as a temporary guide right. to help in the meantime until Jesus. it was time for Jesus. Now this guide helped us to kind of understand what was going to be happening in the future and to right. see why we needed it to happen. See, the law shows us why do we need Jesus to come at all. Well, the law shows us. So, but then once Jesus had come, this temporary guide is of no benefit because now we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We just don't need that anymore. It was just to keep you guys, you know, uh, kind of, seeking me yeah. in the meantime, just to kind of give you a filler. Right. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. But then they said, okay, the law is the fulfillment of all the promises. No, it's not. Us being in the promised land and being in Canaan, that's the fulfillment of the promise. No, it's not. No. Us having a pre a human priest is the fulfillment. No, it's not. Us having a temple is the... No, it's not. It was never about the temple. It was never about Israel. It was never about the, the law. It was never about any of those things. But they misunderstood because they didn't read the whole law. They just read the parts that they liked. Right. Okay, do this, and hey, God's going to bless me. And hey, as long as I do all my meaningless, you yes. know, rote memory stuff... God's going to save me because, you know, or I'm going to be saved because I have earned my salvation, basically. But that's not what it was about at all. So they completely misunderstood what was happening. And uh, I wish I could say more. I love talking about the law, but it, not the right place. So, uh, no, no, it was a good question. But I, the problem is me, not your question. I, I get really off topic with it because I just, uh, okay, all right. So anyways, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the, in the flesh, I far more. <laughs> Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Now, I want you to understand, though, that when he says blameless, he, he's not saying perfect. He was not perfected by the law. Okay? I'll come back to that. Um, so basically what he's saying is he was a good Pharisee. Okay, He he was a good Jew and, and he was a good Pharisee. He was really a top-notch legalist. Okay, But when he says blameless, he's talking about his upstanding. If you look at the context here, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. In other words, I was, I was doing a pretty good job following the law. You know, I, I was above reproach. Okay? Once again, not perfect. Just a good example. Some people get a little bit carried away. There was no such thing as salvation by works of the law. And the law only ever condemned anyone. It never saved anyone. Okay, People were saved before the law was given and after the law was given. The law was not contingent on salvation ever. Um, okay. So, uh, 3, 7 through 9. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. See, he just said, not the righteousness of my own derived from the law, that righteousness that I said that I had attained in verse 6. Um, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his res resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. So, none of those things matter. We are made righteous by God. And I, we're not going to get into verse 10. I know I read into verse 10 just so you could kind of see how the sentence uh, went, but we're going to stop there. Um, and may be found in him, not having righteousness my own, derived from the law. But that which is through the faith. Yeah, okay. So the the moral of what he's saying there is just none of those things really mattered. None of those things really mattered. In fact, not only did they not matter, they were almost like a bad – in fact, they were a bad thing because they were just another thing that got in the way of Christ. So um, I think that he might be hinting to the fact that you know maybe he had a little bit of a hard time giving up his pride in himself You know when he was first saved. Um he wouldn't be the first one. So anyways, um, any questions on that? We covered a lot of ground tonight. But it only took us... Well, it, we would have been done at, at 30 minutes, but then I got really, really sidetracked with, with talking about the lobs. So anyways, uh, any questions? No comments? We're good?
Okay, don't forget there's a question box if you have any anonymous questions. Um, okay, so the riddle of the week. Forward I am heavy, but backward I am not. What am I? <laughs> a belly. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what I thought, too. <laughs> That's not the right answer, but that is what I thought. 